everyone. My name is Shikha Potter. I am the manager of awareness and skill building at SciSec. Welcome to today's webinar. This webinar is a part of SciSec's weekly series titled Samga Chhatva. May we all progress together. The objective is to cover cybersecurity topics and provide conceptual overview to various aspects of security. Let us start with some ground rules. All attendees of the webinar will be on mute by default. We will have a question and answer session twice in this webinar, once in the middle and the other at the end of the presentation. So in case the participants have any questions, you can type them on the chat window and the speakers will respond. We are also going to record this webinar and this recording will be uploaded on the SciSex YouTube channel. So the participants can always refer back to the video later. This is the 18th webinar of this series and the topic today is Introduction to Intrusion Prevention Systems. We have partnered with McAfee for this webinar. We have another webinar upcoming with McAfee and we'll be sharing the registration link shortly. I'm sure that you will all find this series of webinars very useful. We hope that these webinars will kindle your interest in the field of cybersecurity as well. As usual, let us talk about assessment. We will have an assessment after this webinar and it will be open for 60 minutes. The questions are from the topics which are covered in this webinar. So listen carefully. Those who get more than 20 marks will be given a certificate of achievement. Those who are unable to take the assessment will be provided the certificate of participation. At the end of the assessment, you will also be asked to provide feedback. Please provide your genuine feedback. It really helps us improve. And be rest assured that it won't have any bearing on your assessment. Please ensure that the details you provide while you're writing your assessment are clearly mentioned because a certificate will be generated based on these details. The link of the assessment will be shared at the end of the webinar in the Q&A chat section. Please note, this assessment is only open to those who have participated in this webinar. Let me now take this opportunity to introduce the speakers for today's webinar on introduction to intrusion prevention systems. We have experts from the McAfee team who will be speaking in today's webinar. First, we have Mr. Venkat Reddy. He works as a software development lead with McAfee in encryption products. He has an experience of over 13 years in the industry. We welcome you, sir. We also have Mr. Karthik Mehta, who is a technical lead at McAfee with a vast experience of 18 plus years across domains from engineering, technical support, and system administration. Welcome, Karthik. Next, we have Ms. Kritika Sopti, who works as a security researcher at McAfee. Thanks for joining us today, Kritika. I'm sure your participation will inspire many young girls and women to take up careers in the field of security. We have Mr. Karan Bhera, who is a software engineer with McAfee and has over a decade of rich experience, which he'll be sharing with us today through this webinar. Then we have Mr. Arun Kumarji, who is the techno technical lead in NSP at McAfee with over a decade long experience. We welcome you, sir. We are hopeful that all participants will find these sessions knowledgeable and enriching. We are always open for your feedback. I will now hand over to Karthik from the McAfee team. Over to you, Karthik. Thanks, Shikha. Okay, so let's share the screen. Okay, so can we start? 
So good evening, everyone. A warm welcome from McAfee team to all the participants for this cybersecurity webinar. Today, we will discuss about network intrusion prevention and encryption topics. As the world of internet grows day by day, along with it brings the increasing risk of security threats. These threats are more sophisticated and targeted in nature. Malicious URLs, viruses, and malware have grown multifold in the recent years. And with this increased threat of criminals trying to steal consumer data, as well as corporate data, security has become one of the top most priority for any organization. Next, for this webinar, we will cover the threat landscape, parameter level protection using intrusion prevention system that is IPS, types of IPS IDS, detection approaches, challenges with IPS and IDS, encryption, and follow with a short demo showcasing how the devices work. Team who have been working to bring this presentation together are Arun Kumar, Karan Beda, Kritika Sopti, Venkat Reddy, and myself, Karthik Mehta. So let's understand what is a threat landscape. Next, if we notice, all the businesses across the world has made great progress from technology perspective, from the dot-com phase where companies started their online presence using websites, businesses have made advancement in e-commerce, mobile platform, big data and analytics, social media, and many other fields. However, along with this advancement, businesses has also seen higher incidence of cyber threats or cyber attacks on the network. Many of such attacks are listed here. These attacks can cause financial impact as well as loss of reputation to any organization if they encounter a data breach. Let's take an example of ransomware. It is a malicious software that infects your computer and displays messages demanding a fee to be paid in order for your system to work again. If we take another example of a DDoS attack or a distributed denial of service attack where multiple compromised systems, that is botnets, are used to target web servers or any network resources and make them unavailable temporarily or indefinitely disrupting the services of a company. So technological advancement, as we saw, have contributed to the growth of businesses. However, this has also increased the challenges for security professionals as they have to remain vigilant all the time to provide protection. Let's look at some of the contributing factors to the current security threat environment. First is the internet-based business world. Next is the mobility and bring your own device, that is BYOD. Next is social networking sites, followed with storage devices, and the hacking tools which are available freely on the internet. So first we saw the threat environment, then the contributing factors, and now we will see the common attack types which are used by attackers regarding their skill level as a common strategy. That is, use the tools available to search the network for a weakness and then exploit that weakness. Some of the common attack types are listed here, like reconnaissance, exploit, APTs, and many other attacks. However, these attacks can be broadly categorized as passive attacks or active attacks. When we say passive attacks, it monitors the network to capture or steal sensitive data, while active attacks take advantage of vulnerability in the software for intrusion or disruption of a service or cause damage to critical assets. So network security helps businesses to protect themselves against these attacks, which can cause disruption to service or loss of data. And this type of security device not only counters the cyber threats, but can stop such threats from entering on your network as well. 
Now let's see what is an IDS or intrusion detection system. An IDS is a system that monitors your network traffic for suspicious activity and raise alarms or alerts when such activity is observed on your network. An IDS is actually a passive device which will only raise an alarm for malicious traffic but not block them and therefore is considered to be reactive in nature. So how does an IDS function? If one looks at this diagram, there are two switches deployed on your network having connectivity to IDS as span port. This span feature, also called as port mirroring, is available at switches and when they are enabled, will send a copy of network traffic, that is all incoming as well as outgoing traffic, to the IDS for monitoring of any suspicious activity. Now let's look at what is an IPS, that is intrusion prevention system. As the name indicates, it will monitor the network traffic and detect any malicious activity on the network. However, in addition to detection, it will also block and stop the attack entering onto your network. So IPS not only detects, but also blocks the attack and this type of protection is proactive in nature. As you see in this diagram, when an IPS is deployed or configured in inline mode, it will be connected to two network devices, that is a router and a switch on either side of the network using either an Ethernet cable or a fiber cable. This connectivity ensures that an IPS is deployed in between two network devices and is able to examine the traffic in real time as they pass through the device. This is the only mode that will prevent attacks from reaching the target. So broadly, we can classify the IDS or IPS in two categories. One is the network base and another is the host base. The network base IDS or IPS, as we just discussed, can be deployed on network to monitor, detect and prevent the malicious activity by analyzing the traffic throughout the network. However, the host based IDS or IPS are systems installed to analyze the activity within a single host, which could be your servers, your workstation or any other system to detect and prevent the malicious activity. The host based IPS primarily analyze the code behavior using both signature and anomaly based detection. In few of the previous slide, we saw a very basic level of network diagram related to the network IDS or IPS. Here is an example of an organization with an IPS deployment, which is generally observed in a corporate network. This network setup as company headquarters on the network that is on the internet, a branch office also connected to the internet and various internal segments that is the engineering, database, finance, manufacturing, and many other segments generally distributed through various VLANs, that is virtual LANs marked here as sub interfaces. Now, there is a firewall that is a network firewall also deployed here on the network. One can come across some overlap in functionalities between the firewall and the network IPS. However, IPS is not a replacement of firewall and vice versa, but they complement each other. IPS, in fact, adds a layer of security or an additional layer of security to your organization. Now, depending on the network setup, one might need a high-end IPS on your corporate network, that is the headquarters office, right, which will be monitoring the data center or the core network devices. And at the branch office, a low end IPS may also suffice for protection. Similarly, a mid range IPS or a mid end IPS can help to protect the internal segments classified as engineering and manufacturing, finance, administration, and etc. Now, placing the network IPS at the perimeter can block attacks from getting into your network. 
you can place the appliance that is the ips in front of the firewall that is in span mode or behind the firewall that could be in inline mode a network ips placed internally can also protect vlan traffic and stop attacks from a particular segment by either quarantining or isolating a network segment next now let's see what is gartner's definition of next generation ips by the way gartner is the world's leading research and advisory company gartner magic quadrants is a research methodology and a visualization tool for monitoring as well as evaluating the positions of various companies in a specific technology based market so a next generation ips should have the capabilities of first generation ips which we just talked earlier that is the systems should use signature based detection statistical anomaly detection and profile of users and host systems to detect suspicious network behavior now this level of protection was good enough for a long time however with the increase in sophistication of the attacks there was a need for ips and ids to evolve and become application context and content aware to provide a broader, broader coverage so when we talk about application awareness the ips or ids should aggregate the network intelligence in real time to enable security administrator to actually enforce corporate policies regarding the usage of approved applications that is if we take an example of gmail chat or facebook or any such applications many companies would like to block the access of these applications for their employees during working hours but later allow them access so that they can go back and check their mails similarly for contextual awareness accurate and timely detection of attacks is an essential requirement for a next generation ips for however for content awareness if you see an ips or an ids should be able to inspect the threats which are embedded as content such as a content embedded in pdf files or microsoft office files or many such other files now i'll welcome kritika to cover the next set of topics related to detection mechanisms thank you thank you karthik <clears throat> so moving on so by now we know what an ids ips system is we know how it works what are the types of it but one of the basic questions one would ask is how the ids ips knows that this is the traffic that i need to flag as malicious and this is the traffic that i need to say it's benign traffic and needs not be stopped but when i say traffic what does it actually mean what is this traffic network that we are talking about so for someone to capture this traffic what you can do is you can use multiple tools like wireshark the t shark which is a command line tool or the network monitor and capture that traffic on your devices interface so as to have a better look and understanding of the traffic what you see here right now is a capture from a wireshark session and so one flow between a client and a server can have a large number of packets inside and these packets have different layers to them as per the tcp ip stack what you see here is the stream of the http traffic which is on the top layer so what you see in red is the request part of it what the client sends to the server to request for a particular browser or a particular page in the session and what you see in blue is the response from the server the code which is basically rendered to show a web page this is how the network traffic looks like moving on to how an ids ips system identifies the traffic or how it detects the traffic it uses two basic approach a signature or a rule based approach and a signature less approach the signature less approach can again be based on some anomalies or some behaviors or it can be based on certain features known as heuristics we will go through each of these approaches one by one moving on to the first approach which is signature based approach signature based ids are basically looking for some known patterns 
that indicate some malicious activity. So for example, you see here in the URI, there is a certain string. So a client is trying to access the server with the following URI, URI which in the end has cmd.exe, which basically means it's trying to open the command prompt at the server machine. This activity in no way very benign and obviously indicates some malicious intention. And so a signature based rule would be identifying this token cmd.exe inside the URI and flagging an alert. Other examples where signatures can be used, it's simply like a code, like an if and else condition based code. So the format will be obviously proprietary to the device, but the logic remains the same. For example, a telnet session is happening and inside that the policy says for an organization that username of root should not be used by the employees. So we can create a signature which basically says that if the traffic is telnet, the username is root, flag an alert. Or another email campaign which is happening where a freepix.exe which is a malware payload being transmitted as an attachment over email with the subject being something like free pictures. So you can create a rule which says if in an SMTP traffic there is a text of free pictures inside the subject line and there is a file payload which has the name freepix.exe you can flag an alert. Before flagging, obviously, there would be some pre-processing happening, which would be a combination of some hardware and software by the IPS that would be detokenizing this whole network stream, which is binary data, and making some logical string sense out of it. The advantages of any signature-based IDS IPS is because we know exactly what to look for in terms of the patterns. It is very effective to block against those attacks. And also because of this, the accuracy rate is extremely high. Because string matching or token matching is a simple comparison based approach, the speed of such appliances is also very fast. And so if deployed between the network, it does not cause any unconditional lags. The other feature is that the DB can be updated as per needs to protect against whichever new attack that you want your organization to be protected against without making some huge configuration device changes. The challenges for the signature based approach is of course, again, it's only as strong as the rules inside it. For example, right now the attack is if you open a cmd.exe uh, file on the server, it can give you an unauthorized access. Maybe tomorrow there is something like cmd2.exe, which again gives you the access. If there is no signature which specifies that, that attack will pass through and the IDS IPS solution will not be able to detect it. And therefore, it is not effective against any of the zero day attacks being launched. The second type of identification techniques that IDS IPS use is anomaly based. It basically means that they track some unknown unique behavior pattern to determine that something wrong is happening inside the network. This anomalies can either be statistical in nature, they can be application based, or they can also be some anomalies in terms of the protocol. What that basically means is, you, for example, in a statistical anomaly, the network administrator knows that the network profile of a particular organization is such that most of the high traffic volume is there during the daytime. But suddenly there is an observation that at nighttime, there is a lot of huge upload download happening. That can be an indicator to the administrator that something wrong is going on where some illegal access is happening. And the IDS IPS can be configured to track such activities. Another anomaly can be based on the protocol. So every protocol which is out there has a particular set of standards defined to it, which is known as, known as its RFC, which is approved by the IETF. And because it's approved and the standards are always very clear in terms of the syntax, if anybody is trying to use a standard which is different from them, for example, something says HTTP 1.1 should be used and attacker is trying to create a uh, traffic where it is HTTP 1 space dot 1. So in that case, because the IDS IPS solution will not be able to identify it correctly, an attack can pass through. But using anomaly based, you can actually start to track those attacks also, which are not according to a syntax. The advantages of this approach is because it is thoroughly screening the whole traffic, there is very few chance of something passing through. However, the 
approach is also independent of signature. But because it is scanning so much of traffic in terms of its behavior, it can be very slow. And so it can cause a lot of lag in real time. Another disadvantage is because it's just behavior based on the behavior, the behavior can also change due to some non-malicious activity. Maybe it's just that the time zones of the company employees have changed and so the activity is happening in the night time. It can cause a lot of false positives, which basically means it will cause an alert also when something wrong is not happening. So this is what is anomaly based IDS. The third kind of approach is heuristics based. Now in this, it's kind of an expert analysis where some characteristics or features of the files or the payloads that are being transferred are used to detect if they are malicious or not. This can be done by using AI, which is artificial intelligence, where the whole flow of traffic is studied in terms of its parameters, say what are the ports it's uh, transmitting on, how long are the sessions, what kind of packets come inside the sessions. So there can be hundreds of features of a particular flow and using that the device can be trained to detect malicious traffic. The other approach is where the actual malware payloads are kind of simulated using sandboxing techniques and their behaviors are observed. And based on those characteristics, the real traffic payloads are blocked. This is the heuristic based approach. The advantage of this is it can also detect newer attacks because the system or the device is becoming intelligent or it's actually replicating the behavior of the payload or the malware. It can actually detect anything new which comes in. However, again, in this case, also the false positive rate is quite high because there is no fixed patterns or tokens to look into. So these were the three basic approaches that any IDS IPS uses. They can also use a combination of these approach because that offers a much resilient detection. This is something the big organizers, organizations work to develop these devices and big organizations, which might be enterprises or institutions, they would deploy these devices. But how can someone who is just starting, maybe a student, see and try the IDS IPS rule sets? For that, there is something known as SNOT. Now, SNOT is a community where even uh, some organizations use the SNOT uh, IPS for protection, but it can also be used as a good learning point or the starting point if you want to try how the IDS IPS works. It's a community where hundreds of thousands of users are there. All the rules are updated very frequently and new and new rules are added to it. There is a paid subscription for the rule sets and there is also an open source version of it. And the SNOT is very fast. The basic architecture of SNOT looks something like this, where the first component is a sniffer, which basically sits on the interface and tries to sniff or capture whatever network traffic is coming through. Then there is a preprocessor, which will basically look at those packets, divide it into meaningful information, like this is the URI, this is the body, this is the request, this is the response. And then there's the detection engine where all the rules are written. And after, based on those rules, it, it decides to uh, carry out the possible alerts or logs of the traffic. The whole snot can also be deployed just like in IDS, either in inline mode, where it sits in between, and before reaching the target, analyzes the network or it can be in the mirroring or span mode where it will just be taking a copy of the data and trying to analyze it. A simple snot rules has the following structure. The first thing that you configure while writing a snot rule is the action. What action do you want the IDS or the IPS to take in order for it to, uh, if it satisfies a particular rule? So the action can be something like just alert that there is something going on, just log that there was something that happened, just let, let the traffic go, which is pass, drop the packet that is block the tra traffic and log an entry, reject, which basically means after blocking and logging the traffic, also send a re TCP reset packet back to the uh, source so that they also know that the traffic was blocked. And the last is S drop, which basically means block or stop the traffic, but do not make a log entry. After specifying the action to be taken, you also have to specify the protocol, which basically means the underlying traffic is a TCP based, UDP based, ICMP based, which is your ping commands or IP based. 
After that, you refer to the source address and the source port information, the direction if it is source to destination or it is bidirectional, the destination information, address and port, followed by the actual rule logic. So the example that we took in the first place, which was of a cmd.exe in the URI, the snort rule written for the same would be something like alert for the TCP traffic because it's HTTP, the underlying is TCP coming from outside the network external net to any of the ports going to the HTTP server, you would have configured a list of the server IPs and then on port 80, which is HTTP port. The message is what you show in the alert and the content is basically URI content. So which basically means in the URI, there should be a content or a token, which is cmd.exe. So this is how a simple snort rule can be written. Moving on to the challenges of the IDS IPS industries. After they are deployed, there can be a lot of challenges that both the users who deploy these devices face. And also there are challenges for the industry itself because of increased in the sophisticated nature of the attacks which are happening day by day. So first we will go through the challenges for the users or the customers. The first challenge that the customer faces is deployment. They have bought an IDS IPS device, but where to actually deploy that device before the firewall, after the firewall? In, do we do it for smaller networks? Do we just attach one to the perimeter? So the study of that deployment for the administrators is also very crucial to determine how the IDS IPS will be effective. So that is the first challenges that the customers face. The second challenge that they face is a high volume of alerts because the alerts can be so many for a big organization and for a network administrator to log in and see tens of thousands of alerts, it is very difficult to make sense of them. And that is the next challenge which the IDS IPS uh, industry customers face. The third challenge is investigation because the number is so huge. There can be a lot of false positives also based on the organization's network traffic. And there can also be a need to correlate a few alerts so that they start making more sense. Maybe by correlating three to four alerts, you start realizing, okay, it was an advanced persistent threat for the company. And so the investigation part also takes a huge time. The fourth challenge is how to respond, how to decide that this kind of attacks, if there should be blocked. This kind of attacks should just be logged and should be observed in correlation with the other attacks. So determining an appropriate response and configuring that is also another challenge. Statistics show that the network administrators say that it takes around months, years, or even weeks to determine that something wrong is happening inside the network because of the humongous alerts that they say. Coming on to the challenges that the industry faces. The first challenge is six set database updation because the attacks keep launching day by day, new attacks are coming in and the patterns can change. This six set updation is a very frequent activity and requires a lot of research. Also, there's a challenge of false positives versus the false negatives. What false positive refers to is an alarm or an alert was triggered even when something non-malicious was happening. So it basically shows there's an error in the rules created. However, false negatives determine that it was claimed that there is an alert to protect against a particular attack. But when that attack happened, no alert was triggered. It might be because something in terms of the patterns or the tokens has changed and the signature was not updated. So there's a constant struggle to manage reduce false positives and reduce false negatives by the uh, IDS IPS developers, signature developers. The second challenge is, which is rising nowadays is encrypted traffic. As more and more focus is going on to security, it is seen that most of the traffic is becoming encrypted. Now, because the traffic is encrypted, a device sitting in between of the client and server cannot read that traffic. It's not legible. And so how should it detect it? So the IDS IPS industry has to come up with means to decrypt the traffic in line for a better protection and also manage the time delays caused by the same. The third challenge is evasions. The hackers also know that people are going to deploy this solution. So they are constantly trying to one up on the IDS IPS appliance. 
The one technique they used is obfuscation, where they changed the code in such a way that the result output is the same. However, the code now looks different so that the signatures are not working. For example, if you see here a JavaScript code, it says, hello, obfuscation in progress. And the same code can be written using some URI encoding mechanisms also, where the space, which is 20 hex, can be written percentage 20. And even now, the result would be same. But now, because if you have written something to detect the first part, the second part will start failing. The second technique of evasion being used is compression. If you see the response in the first traffic capture above, it's legible. You can understand what it is. However, if the same content is sent in compressed form, the device will actually have to decompress the traffic in between before alerting for a malicious activity. And that decompression can take time, causing lags, or it might just let go of the traffic. So this is a second approach. Uh, apart from this, attackers also use uh, evasion techniques like fragmentation, which is dividing the packets into smaller, smaller chunks. So if the IDS is not enabled to reassemble the packets, it won't be able to make sense of it. And also new formats. For example, maybe the device knows how to handle a doc file. But because now it's a docx file, it cannot decompress the doc file and get the information out of it. So that is another challenge. Now we have a small demo of uh, McAfee's IDS IPS solution, which has a tie in with multiple approaches, both signature based, signature less. It has better visibility for the users and it has a lot of actionable workflows. So what we understand is there is a client and a server which, is, which are trying to communicate with each other, where the client trying to access the information hosted onto the server. Now, when that happens, uh, there is a device, which is a physical IDS IP solution, which is uh, placed exactly in between of these two. And based on if we want to protect the client or we want to protect the server, the configuration and the deployment can be managed. While doing so, uh, the physical box is actually the IDS IPS, but the counterpart of that physical box is this what you see, which is a dashboard, a UI interface. For McAfee, we have a network security manager, which we can use to log in and basically control that physical device. This is what the dashboard looks like. The da this is the analysis tab out of it. Right now, we will be using it to show an actual demo. There are no alerts, but in a real case scenario, this is where you see real time alerts happening one after the other. I have configured it so that no alerts are seen here right now. So better understand the demo. This is one of my client machines that I have here, which is uh, placed. And there is also another server machine that I have created. In between these two machines is where my actual device is deployed. Now, if I use the wget utility, to launch a uh, attack, which is based on cmd.exe, as we discussed before, let's see what happens. Now here it's trying to connect, but something is blocking it. If I were to go onto my UI, which is my network security manager or NSM, I would see that now there is an alert. On double clicking this alert, we realize that there is more information that the administrators can gain about what happened. So as it shows here, the application is HTTP. So there was HTTP traffic. Then signature was used as one of the detection mechanism. It can also get information about who was attacking. So this is the IP. What was getting attacked, which is your target. You can also get other information like more layer seven data for more analysis. What was the user agent? What was the host information? All this information you can get here. Apart from this, you can also get other information, which is like uh, the description. So here we tell exactly what the attack does, the nature of the attack, other criteria like its uh, severity, priority, and then there is a CVE ID. So there's a regulatory body which assigns a CVE unique ID to every new vulnerability out there. And so almost all the alerts are tagged onto a particular CVE information that you can see on the NSM. So this is information about the attack, in which case the server was getting exploited. Now, what if the client is doing some browsing and they are under an attack? So in this case, we have another demo. Now, let there be uh, the server machine, 
On the server machine, for example, a file is hosted, hosted which is Artemis high.exe. It is a malware file. Now, while browsing, maybe the client tries to download this file, again, using the wget utility. You see, it's failing and it's trying to retry again and again. If we go onto the NSM and check, it will again have an alert for it, which says there was a ma malicious file that is detected by GAM. Now, GAM is one of uh, McAfee's detection engine, which is not based on uh, this rules, but rather it's a different heuristic based engine approach. Again, you can see more details about this attack. Uh, sorry, this is the first attack that I have opened. Let me go back and open the other attack. Yes, this is the detail for the uh, malware attack. So the malware attack which has happened, this is the uh, details for it. The, again, the layer 7 information, the hash information of the malware file, and the description about what kind of malicious activity was happening. So this, uh, this is what malware files or protection can look like. Okay. So after seeing this, as you see right now, it's very few alerts. It's easy to make a sense out of this. But in a real case scenario, these alerts are huge in number. If I were to change this from last five minutes to something of, say, a different value, let's see what will happen to the number of alerts. We are changing it to 24 hours. Can you see how many number of alerts are there? And can you make sense of it? And what if we were to change it to what happened in my network for the last one week? Now, the alerts are huge. And it is very difficult for any administrator to realize actually what is happening inside the network. So for this purpose, we have something which is known as the dashboard. Let's go on to the NSM dashboard now. Okay, so now what happens is all those alerts with a single view, you can see some analytics on top of those alerts. You can have a one picture about what is happening in your network. You can see the top attacks happening. You can also see what were the attacker IPs that were trying to target you. This can help in tracing the root cause analysis about the types of attacks and where the organization is from threat under. So it helps in investigation. You can also get the IPs of the machine inside your network which were being attacked. That is, these are the machines you need to go and patch. Apart from this, you get information like applications which are under attack, most of them. And because in a real world organization scenario, it's not one IDS appliance which is there. It can be multitude appliances which are there and they are all connected together. So it also helps you analyze the health, the memory of all of those devices at from one portal. So this is what a single shot of your network looks like and it helps the administrators. Now, how do the administrators, administrators configure each of the devices? They do so in this devices tab. There is information about each of the devices deployed and the physical ports is where actually you attach your network feed to the physical device. You can go and configure this feed to be, right now if you see in port one, it's inline mode. You can go ahead and change it and maybe make it as a span mode as we discussed earlier. So you can configure your devices in whichever way you like using the same UI. After configuring your devices, understanding the dashboard, let's move on to the next thing, which is the policy. Now, if we see the first policy type, which is the IPS policy, what this has is the huge chunk of signatures or the rules which the solution provides you and these are updated on a weekly basis. So, for example, we were to open one policy, which is default testing. We will see how many rules are currently deployed if we apply this policy. So, right now, if you see, this policy has 24,000 plus attacks, signatures or rules. So, if I apply this policy to my device, all these rules will become active. The administra administrators can choose which rules or which policy they want to apply. They can also create new policies. Moving on to the malware policies, there are different engines which are there as part of the product. It can be a reputation engine, it can be the anti-malware engine, or it can also be integration with other McAfee products. And all of those you can configure about how to detect a malware. They might be using a heuristic-based approach. Uh, for example, they would be uh, using a sandboxing technique, or uh, they would be using some intelligence to determine, and that can also be integrated as part of the alerts. The third policy that you can configure is the inspection options. 
as we said there are always evasion attempts happening and the devices need to be up to date so for example there is a compression evasion happening so the mcafee appliance can also decompress that uh, that data and still manage to find the malicious activity after we enable the http response decompression feature or some attackers are using smtp encoding to hide their attempts we the mcafee product also has an smtp decoding feature so all the features can be enabled from this particular part also the mcafee appliance protects against the encrypted traffic also because the uh, we do encryption of the decryption of the traffic and we are still able to detect the alerts so there are multitude of features for the product this is just a brief glimpse of some of the features and with this we would end the demo and we are open to any of the questions that for a small session 10 minute session of answering any questions and then we'll move on to the next topic Um, so I see a, a bunch of questions in the Q and A window. I think most of them have been responded. Um, is there anything that you think uh, we should elaborate on? We can probably, uh, you know, uh, do it now. Okay. If somebody wants a more extensive answer, they can, I think, reply, and we can take it up that way. Sure. Um, or also, if you know, uh, if any of the uh, experts here uh, think that you know they want to elaborate on the on the response provided in the Q and A window, uh, we can uh, uh, we can do that as well. Okay. So yeah. Let's. anything needs so i think there is one common question uh, regarding ips can detect and prevent the intrusion whereas ids can only detect the intrusion so in an organization why still they are using ids so let let me take that question okay so in any organization right means it all depends on how sensitive uh, sensitive is your network that is whether if you are hosting a banking application or if let's say there cannot or let's say even uh, say stock market right or any uh, any such kind of uh, time sensitive application it can uh, cause issues if there is any kind of outage so many companies depending on their security policies may decide to either use the ips in uh, say detection mode or in just say uh monitoring mode rather than the prevention mode okay so uh, there is one more question which basically talks about how uh, ransomware are protected against so for protection of any uh, of the new malware that are there the protection is twofold there can be protection which is based on the network traffic which can be handled by the ids ips there can also be protection which can be deployed in the host machine itself which can be in the most basic sense be your antivirus solutions so for example the new some of the ransomwares which come in there can be some associated network behavior with them there can be something known as the iocs which is the indicators of compromise uh, that you know for example a certain ransomware is coming attached with a uh, known ssl certificate a, a hacker has an already tagged uh, certificate which it's using to drop the malware but that certificate we know is not having a good reputation it's a bad certificate so there can be a detection based on that there can be detection based on the behavior of the malware where it comes in from the host information or how what other network activity it is starting once it's in the machine 
Further, there can also be, uh, because for example, the IPS product that we have, McAfee solution, we integrate with other engines also. So maybe the drop of the malware is of a particular file for which the detection of that file is already being provided by the other engines. So once those engines are also incorporated, because we know that the file that is coming in the network is having that features of that ransomware, the IPS blocks that file then and there. So the payload gets blocked by the network because the IPS device is integrated with the other engines that uh, analyze that ransomware on the fly. So detection of any of the malwares can be at both the ends, network end as well as the host end. And it's an integration of all of this to better product protect your network. Okay, so there is one more question regarding the SIEM integration. So I think that's a complete uh, it's a different uh, solution. But yes, IPS or uh, any of those network or parameter based uh, solutions do provide integration with the SIEM, any SIEM devices. So that is most likely available. And depending on what solution a company might be using, uh, most of them do provide the integration. Okay, uh, if we can move now or I think we can move on and we can have a second session after the uh, second part, which can be a mix of both the sessions. So um, for the sure, next yeah. session, okay, thank you, Karthik. So for the next session, we have Venkat who would be taking up uh, and telling us about encryption. Venkat, over to you. Thank you, Kritika. Thank you, Karthik, uh, for taking us through the wonderful idea solution. Thanks, okay. uh, Good evening, everybody. Uh, yeah, it's uh, so far it has been a wonderful solution we talked about. Now we'll move on to the uh, next topic, which is encryption. So when you hear, hear about uh, encryption, it's not new but it's it's a very important topic and it comes from the ages so in olden days also people used to communicate in during the war times in a cryptic format with symbols with uh, certain diagrams etc so encryption is very important topic so the encryption what a encryption means right suppose uh, if i say hey karthik bonjour he just uh, start uh, star staring at me he's not replying me but uh, when I say Karthik Namaskara, it's really uh, Namaskara Venkat. So it is as simple as uh, that. So here in French, we say bonjour for hello. In Canada, we will say uh, Namaskara, correct? So when he understands that, he is able to reply. So the encryption here is importantly. So we are uh, transferring the message from your understandable format into unrecognizable or ununderstandable format so that third party person third person cannot uh, uh, understand that so decryption is the way opposite of that so it is a process of converting encrypted information into the understandable or plain format correct next we will take a one simple example so there is a caesar cipher so what it does is, it, in a plain English language, alphabets, it replaces the each letter with the another letter with a shift. For example, in this case, we have the plain text, the quick brown. Here, if T is replaced by the letter Q, which is uh, three letters left shift, correct? So it has become QUB. NRFGH, YOLTK, nobody, able, nobody is able to understand that. So it has come into the cipher text format. So the encrypted form of the uh, information is called cipher. So this is uh, when a plain text is converted into cipher text, it is called encryption. And when we, when we do the opposite of this, it is decryption. Next. Why is encryption, why should we use encryption, right? What is the importance of that? So confidentiality. 
so confidentiality of the information is very much important so let's say my salary is confidential to me let's say the data of uh, our uh, other card database is confidential to our country so confidentiality of the information is very important next is integrity integrity of the data is very much required right so if if you are uh, if you are communicating uh, information for uh, via defense communication or so right so if the data is truncated or in between the data is lost so that if the message is lost right so the it it carries a different meaning or it, it is making nonsense unsensible at all so integrity of the data is important availability availability of data it is actual availability of the data any time uh, any time available to you for example if we take netflix the movies are always available everybody is interested in watching during lockdown especially so the av always availability availability is one of the important factor of the data so this c confidentiality integrity availability which forms the cia triad so that is encryption is one of the important uh, topic for this next if we come to the different types of encryption so there are there is a symmetrical encryption it is one of the simple kind of encryption which uses a single key for both encryption and decryption for example as we see in the picture the plain text is encrypted using the secret key it will transform into a cipher text which you cannot understand and the same key is used to decrypt the information back to plain text so it is a symmetric key that is getting used suppose if you a simple example could be if you zip a file with some password and you tell the same password to someone else so that password becomes the sing, sing, single key correct the import the examples of symmetric algorithms there is aes standard 128 aes 192 aes 256 these are the uh, some of the examples for this yeah we will see another type of encryption next there is a asymmetrical encryption as uh, we saw in symmetrical encryption it uses the single key in asymmetrical encryption we see two different key two keys which are mathematically related one one part one key com com consists of public key and the other part of the key other key is called it as private key so when you for example when you visit a any http website your browser establishes a symmetrically encrypted connection with that website your web browser automatically derives the public key of the ssl or tls certificate installed on that website that is why it's called public key if you would like to see uh, the key you can click on the green padlock in front of the url and you can see the certificate details so here as we see in pictor pictographically there is a plain text it was converted to cipher text and then back to uh, plain text using different keys so examples of encryption right so uh, practically we see encryption in different kinds of digital co communications digital uh, applications web browser integration is one of the important one so we see the uh, lock symbol which is making it secure which is en encrypted so we will see if we took it if we look at the https yes make secure that is encrypted traffic and email encryption is the another one which uh, attachments to emails needs to be encrypted so body so that nobody else can uh, down, uh, able to understand them that is one of the important we widely use everybody almost uses nowadays whatsapp communication so whatsapp chat comes with the message uh, message to this chat are end to end encrypted so this start this is the in instant message encryption so we we have the encryption required in different formats of the data encryption in the storage device or uh, let's say we have a pen drive we can encrypt that uh, in the removable media we have a hard disk we have a sd card that can be encrypted we have data that is flowing over the network that is can be encrypted next 
So we have the digital data that is we have among us data of amount of data that keeps generating every day and uh, every day and night. So it's it has been there. We have, we have different states of the data. Uh, the data which is at rest, it is the data that is stored physically in disks, in databases, in uh, mobile device SD cards, in mobile device storages, in different backup tapes, etc. Right. So the data that is frequently accessible that can that is also considered as uh, data at rest. Sometimes you may call it as a data in processing. So there is a data in transit. The data that is actually traveling between two different devices, two kinds of networks over the internet. It can be between different countries over the internet. So there is a chat data, there is email data. It is it falls into the data in transition. Next. So when the data is in rest, right? We have to do the encryption of the data to keep it secure. Uh, so we have the, the solutions. We have different forms like full disk encryption. So here the entire wall, basically, when you look at any typical hard disk. It will have a hard. It will have different volumes. Uh, it could be boot volumes, data volumes. So boot volumes, when it comes right, these these are the volumes which by default should require for any OS. And uh, data volumes, you can choose. Uh, you, you, those are the volume. Those are the data that you can operate and uh, uh, process that with. So the boot volumes are very much required for encryption, so that. Uh, sometimes you somebody cannot alter the boot volumes data so that you will be always be able to boot the data boot into the uh, laptop or a machine correct so boot uh, encryption of the volumes is important so all file when you encrypt a disk correct all the files all the sectors are getting encrypted which which means that all the files or all the data on the disk is encrypted so it is the same key that is uh, used to encrypt the entire volume or the disk. So, it uh, yeah, the key can be stored in different places. Some of the industry standard full disk encryption examples. So, we have a Windows BitLocker. Microsoft has Windows operating systems. It comes along. It comes with BitLocker. So, it is an inbuilt solution. So, this BitLocker will require trusted platform module, uh, which is a hardware module available on the mother motherboard. So that is required, which will store the snapshot of the disk data in a key. That key will be residing in the TPM chip. There is a Mac OS uh, from Apple. File Vault is the disk encryption solution from Apple. There is a Linux for Linux uh, operating system, Linux machines. There is a there is a Lux Linux verified key setup uh, that comes for the disk encryption solution. When we come to proprietary, for example, McAfee com companies like McAfee, they have M McAfee has especially McAfee drive encryption solution, which typically uh, in available in Mac, Mac and Windows as well. Next, now we will see. We so far we saw the uh, disk encryption. Now we will see if the entire disk is encrypted. So is it if some people, some situations may not require entire disk encryption. Some people try to, some some situations requires files to be encrypted individually and files to be omit, omitted from encryption individually. So we have the file based encryption for that. So when, when file is encrypted, right? So it encrypts the files on an individual basis. Maybe it could be a PDF file, it could be a doc file, it could be a, in another file like a, is a simple video file or image file. So with file-based encryption, you can choose to encrypt the file individually and you have the flexibility to key, encrypt the file with a different key, with a different mechanism of the key. For example, password, the key could be coming from the smart card. So different kinds of kinds of uh, examples are available. So you can choose to uh, not encrypt the files, for example, temporary files, 
or there are some files that could be uh, not deleted temporarily for example for example recycle bin etc so those can be omitted from the encryption so when you encrypt the file so when, even when you remove from the system they remain encrypted next <laughs> So yeah, as we see that encryption we are able, we are doing, but what if the key is lost, encryption key is lost, or where should I store it, or how should I maintain it? So the data stored on the uh, laptop, uh, the data could be key, that needs to be exist somewhere else. So the keys are escrowed to cloud solutions, maybe in the cloud, maybe they have the management server. So the keys are escrowed and kept uh, safely in uh, server server manage, server or management uh, uh, places so you if you forget the key someday so you will be asking the uh, administrator to give the recovery key he will be able to give you the recovery key so bitlocker comes with one of the recovery keys mechanism as soon as you, when your password when your password is lost so you can contact admin he will provide one recovery key so for example if you uh, that if you have hard disks for you on different laptops on multiple employees has each laptop has uh, given to one one employee so when the employee left the company or the organization so you might you if you if you have to keep the data safe you have to uh, the you have to erase the disk you have to keep it uh, hard disk safe for so if you have the good encryption solution if you simply lost the, if you simply delete the key of that machine, then nobody can see the data. Nobody can decrypt the data. So that is one of the good uses for administrator to save a lot of cycles in uh, um, in maintain in maintaining the uh, different uh, machines. Next, so data in transition. So. We saw the data in rest so far. So when you come to data in transition, it is very, very, very various forms of various uh, uh, types of uh, trans data that is uh, moving in different places. One could be the email. Email is one of the most common example. It travels over the networks. It could be traveling over the internet. It could be different between, for example, you might have been doing the Bluetooth uh, transfer of the device, tra transfer of the data. So that is also falls into the data in transition. So the, this is the dynamic data that can be protected in uh, two ways. One, one could be if you are doing network uh, connections. So it uh, encrypt the transmission uh, using the encryption network encryption protocols. For, for example, uh, for IP layer, internet protocol layer, we have the IPsec, uh, which is uh, basically the typical example could be VPN virtual private network. It uh, it is uh, most most uh, mostly it uses IPsec or GRE protocols, and there is a TLS transport layer security. It establishes a secure connection between two uh, TLS and uh, trans TCP endpoints. One could be browser is the uh, HTTPS is the one of the best example. And we have the SSH uh, shell, secure shell, that is also falls into the TLS, uh, transport layer security. So other way could be instead of uh, securing the connection, you could encrypt the message and its payload, which ensures that only authorized authorized recipient can decrypt the data and use it. So this uh, forms to the uh, one of some of the examples of data in transition. Yeah, next. So I will be uh, taking you to, uh, so far we have seen the, the kinds of uh, encryptions. I will taking you to the McAfee solution, which is uh, provided uh, to encrypt the files. So it is called uh, McAfee's encryption uh, for file and remo removable media protection. So here I have a one client machine, uh, which, is, which has the FRP installed on that. So I'm logging in as the FRP user. So I have created a user and assigned to this machine uh, previously. So that user has the key, which is a grid, so which which we see in the screen. Now I have a file uh, on the desktop. 
so i want to encrypt that file with on demand which on i want to right click and encrypt so for example once it is here i am choosing the key which needs to be encrypted with so i have currently test key so i encrypted that so we see the lock symbol here so i i would like to update this document uh, with some currently there is some text i want to append some more text into that i am going to append that i, I yeah and when i save that so it is uh, the new data also uh, encrypted so suppose if i remove that if i let me if i reopen the data the data is still i can see still see the data right so if i if i if i not logged in for suppose for example if i logged off from this uh, encryption solution so if i see try to see the data the file is shown as encrypted and we should not we, we are not able to decrypt and see the data so this uh, only the intended users see the file even though that is existing on the disk so this is a file on demand encryption uh, with uh, one user can encrypt and you can protect the same data from uh, another user so in yeah we in the interest of time we will be uh, taking to question uh, question and answers so this uh, as we saw just we can decrypt encrypt here this is one file so we can uh, this demo video maybe will be available later you guys can go through that uh, so in the interest of time we are going to take question and answers after this thank you very much Thank you so much, uh, McAfee team. Uh, it was a really insightful and uh, knowledgeable session. Uh, I think the speakers can take up questions from the chat box that they feel are relevant to the session. In paucity of time, I understand we'll not be able to entertain all the questions. Okay. There was uh, one question. Uh, which, uh, how can I get your certificate? so certificates are given uh, are distributed uh, from by the administrators no additionally uh, if you are talking about certificates right there are some uh say ca or certificate authority which also provides certificate uh to companies so that their traffic can be encrypted so those kind of certificates are also available and the you can also use some self-signed certificates using some open ssl tool uh you can create some self-signed certificates as well I think there is a question regarding demo or evaluation version available for IPS IDS. Uh, for IPS IDS, I don't think so. Uh, it is available because this is a hardware device or a, phys or a physical appliance. So I don't think so. You can get a demo or an evaluation version. But you can always use Snort to get some idea of it, which is open source. Right. I think there is a common question. Uh, what if we forget our our product key? So basically, the encryption key. So that is where the recovery is helping. So the uh, when there is a recovery approach, with uh, initially it could be set with multiple uh, question and answers. Uh, later, you would get a unique key that is uh, stored in the server software. So generally, when you call the IT IT admin, they will give you the recovery key. Yeah, there is another common question. Suppose uh, if there is a uh, one TB hard disk, it is corrupted. So how we will recover that? So corruption in the sense, uh, they, uh, basically the data could not be read by yourself uh, as a standard user. But there there are uh, 
uh, solutions which uh, for example if we come to mcafee mcafee drive encryption comes along with uh, another uh, support solution which is a uh, de tech where uh, we will uh, connect that encryption uh, hard disk uh, to this so this, to this tool and we will start uh, looking at the data sector by sector so there is a uh, there is a re uh, obviously uh, recovery is possible but um, more, uh, maybe some few sectors may not be written correctly those may not be able to uh, recover in very uh, rare cases uh, this could be happening during the some kind of uh, uh, network failure which is completely uh, 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 corrupting the system okay. so there is one more question that is ids is done on real time data or only on logs generated so i think uh, there is already a response but i would just like to add uh, more points to this like ids uh, does look into the traffic which is sent to it so as we saw in one of the earlier slides uh, today right when it would be deployed uh, where through span mode or the port mirroring uh, feature you can copy the traffic or uh, to send it to the network ips or an ids and that it will monitor and uh, provide information of any malicious activity so though it is uh, it's actually we can say it's real time okay uh, in a way where you are copying the traffic uh, or copying the packets uh, to the ids for inspection yeah there is one another question uh, which is best a symmetric or a symmetric encryption algorithm for security see here it is a trade off uh, for example symmetric encryption is a lot quicker compared to the asymmetric method whereas asymmetric method incorporates two keys so the process is slowed down considerably but uh, the keys if you if you don't if you leak the there is a chance that in symmetric you can uh, leak the key so if we, if the key is leaked so anybody can uh, whoever has the key leaked they can decrypt the data correct so whereas in asymmetric only the private key holder can decrypt the data so uh, so this is a trade off um, with some so, um, in some of the solutions so both the way both the mechanisms are used uh, symmetric mechanism as well as asymmetric encryption mechanisms are used so there's one question which says uh, network based ips does it apply to all the layers so uh, now we have moved on from a simple uh, ids ips to what we say as the next generation ones where uh, deep uh, packet inspection takes place and even uh, top layer data gets analyzed and protected so nowadays the features of the ips are extending beyond the network and the uh, the available solutions are advanced enough to even tackle the uh, upper layer traffic. Uh, also, there might be a case that some questions, because there's a huge inflow of questions, we might have missed a few. If your question is missed till now, please enter it again so that we can answer. Most of them we are answering in the chat itself. If there is some questions which require a deeper answer, uh, like an in-depth answer, we are taking it up in audio mode. So there's a question which says, how do you find bugs in a cipher? So basically a cipher is used for encryption as a protection. A bug in the cipher to what a standard refers to would be that the cipher can break easily. So the mathematical function that is used by the cipher is something which can be easily uh, breaked or hacked. And 
So the encrypted data can be decrypted easily by the attacker. So that is the flaw of a cipher, not a bug as per se. Bug is something that you exploit so as to in a software that you exploit and that can be potentially lead to a vulnerability. There is one question now. Is there any mechanism whether the keys are also encrypted? Yes, uh, encryption can be done on keys also. There can be multi-level key. Basically, the, the, the keys uh, are encrypted and the, those encrypted keys itself further can be encrypted and stored. So, yeah, the key, key is also encrypted be, because encryption is ultimately important to secure all the data. So, multi-level encryption is also required. So there is one question, if the hard disk is 350 GB, what is the processor, processor to decrypt in McAfee? It's not depending on the size of the hard disk. So it is the same procedure, but uh, yeah, it takes time according to the size. Processor is same. I think there is uh, one question about how are slow rate attacks detected. So I'll just mm, try to answer that where uh, there is a feature something called as web server denial of service protection where you can go back and enable the slow rate uh, say attacks being triggered as well. So you can go ahead and uh, so there are many solutions which would provide this particular feature. But yeah, they, uh, means many of the IPS solutions, including McAfee, does pro provide a uh, mechanism to identify the slow rate attacks. Uh, there is a question uh, how secure is open source encryption tool where crypt compared to commercial version yeah so uh, we we cannot compare really like that so we have to look at uh, the complete uh, so complete solution uh, as well as the maintenance of that uh, and different uh, proprietary confidential information that can be shared over the by the sales team so yeah we that question we cannot give an answer in in this forum there's one more question like uh, that is which network layer is more vulnerable uh, if, if i understand means there are many ways to exploit each and every uh, layers of OSI model. So depending on the attacker who wants to exploit what uh, in which all manner, they can try to use some tools and exploit the specific, uh, say, using source vulnerabilities or exploits. So I, I won't say which specific layer is most vulnerable, but it all depends on uh, maybe what is the intent of the attacker. Yes. And also, uh, most of the attackers, because of the ease of how it is done, and also because uh, there is a more target 
user base it's mostly web based the attacks which uh, and so they always happen in the upper application layers however if the attack uh, is more sophisticated in nature when you talk about the apts they might be using a combination of attacks in different layers so a successful attack is often a sum of many different attacks one after the other like one attack can be to get some reconnaissance other attack can be done to get access and then there can be a follow up attack which act, which is used for uh, privilege escalation so it can be a combination in multiple layers that can happen to launch a successful complete attack So there's also a question if uh, the difference between IDS and IPS is where IPS can actually also block in uh, addition to, to the detection, what is the use of an IDS? So because the IPS system is uh, also capable of sitting in between and blocking, maybe an organization just wants to monitor what is happening and do, do not actually want to block traffic because maybe the traffic is very critical in nature and so uh, they are concerned about the false positives. In that case, that same appliance is up, uh, is deployed in the IDS mode, where it will only detect it and will not prevent anything. So it's based on a use case where what is the nature of your traffic? Uh, where do you want to actually block attempts or do you want to just monitor it as an afterthought? So it depends on a use case scenario and it can be a combination of both. So it says, how does a user of internet knows that they have been attacked? Now, this answer can have uh, multiple answers. Um, so one thing is, of course, if you see some strong indicator, which is uh, if it's a ransomware, your device is encrypted, or you start seeing ad there's an adware, so you start seeing uh, weird ads while you're browsing the session, or you one of the most common form is uh, it's not very malicious, but one of the common is where your uh, default uh, browser home search bar changes to something uh, which is not popular. So it can be one of those indicators which is easily seen, but uh, the more dangerous attacks are the one where you unknowingly are a part of, say, a big bot network and you are contributing to it. So to get an in-depth analysis, you will have to check your task manager to see what processes are running. You will have to have a thorough idea about what usually your CPU percentage is and maybe you can check that, that there's a sudden increase. So using uh, starting from the task, uh, task explorer is the best way you can start to explore. But yes, there can be multiple uh, indicators for it. So it's good to have some protection in your devices which can do that work for you. Yep. There is one question, uh, any new advancement or technique used in encryption? Yes, it's a, it's a, it's always a uh, research area and it's imp uh, in, in it's improvement uh, required in every in now and then. So there are a, a lot of technologies, a lot of way, a lot of uh, research is going on that in quantum cryptography uh, as well as hardware hardware based encryption, for example, hard disks uh, we generally get ssd uh, there is a opel hard disk which comes from the tpg group the actually the data itself is uh, encrypted by the hardware and stored so you would only require to give the key the actual encryption is done by the uh, hard disk hard disk controller itself so yeah there are another uh, Another example, sir, industry standards are like two-factor authentication. Uh, for example, OTP is one of the uh, two-factor authentication mechanism. Those are some of the areas uh, you can explore.
Uh, yeah, there is one question regarding MAC address is spoofable through MAC address changer. Then how do how how to identify the attacker? So most of the IPS solutions would be providing the R spoofing feature. So that will help to determine if there is any kind of spoofing activity happening uh, over there on your network. So there is one way if you can enable ARP spoofing, it, it can help you to determine if there is uh, any activity malicious happening uh, at the spoofing level. I think we can uh, take the last two questions, uh, looking at the paucity of time, and then wrap up the question and answers round. There is one question, where is uh, encryption keys are getting stored? So encryption keys are uh, generally escrowed to the server software uh, server and they are stored uh, after encrypting further them in the database. May, uh, for example, if you take the uh, BitLocker with TPM trusted platform module chip on that, so the encryption key is stored in that hardware that is used every time to uh, decrypt the proper unlocking the hard drive i feel most of the questions have been answered either verbally or on chat uh, other speakers uh, willing to answer any other questions that they see in the chat? Yeah, we are trying to answer all. Uh, so, like some answer at least uh, is not verbal. At least we are writing it down. Oh, that's great. Thanks, Vitika. Thank yeah. you. Uh, I think we have answered most of them. Yes, I think most of the questions have been answered, uh, either verbally or on chat. Hmm. All right, I think yeah, it's time to wrap the question and answer session. Thank you so much, McAfee team, for taking time out for this session, sharing your knowledge, experience, and for most importantly, patiently answering all the questions. So it was a long list of questions. Some we answered verbally, some on the chat window. Uh, however, if we missed anyone due to shortage of time, we apologize. We will now move on to the assessment part for the participants and share the assessment link for all those who want to take up the evaluation. Uh, the speakers may choose to drop out as per their convenience now. Once again, thanks a lot to McAfee team for this very brilliant, very enriching session. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, Shika, and thanks the team. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. We will now be sharing the assessment.